All right, we're recording. Hello, everyone. I'm Rafi, and I'm here with Brad. Um, first time for us that we're chatting uh, online, but we've uh, exchanged a few messages over Twitter. So how's it going, man? It's going great. Um, I'm just, it's uh, a snowy morning here in upstate New York. I'm, I'm having my coffee and trying to, uh, the uh, exciting announcement is that the pigs, uh, my first round of pigs from Firebrand Meats, the low poof of pork, are in the process of being transported around and cut up into pork chops today so that's a big nice that's a that's a big day for me i'm excited congratulations about that. <laughs> Thank yeah you. it's been a long it's been a long time coming well it takes a while to grow big and so how how old are they uh they're about eight months old i think um okay which is which is uh, kind of slow for i mean it's slow for market hogs right um right the the one the the sort of industrial market hogs they can get to market in about five months. But if you feed them a very low fat diet and force them to make all of their own fat uh, from starch, then they grow a lot slower. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. The, so these are, <laughs> right. Go ahead. I was just saying, yeah. So these are slow grown, um, slow grown pigs and their Berkshire genetics, which is not nearly as fast growing as like a, like a modern, uh, typical kind of like land race Yorkshire cross. And so, um, so old school genetics, um, kind of a new school feed, <laughs> this very low, uh, poof of feed, but, but sort of more similar to like a barley finished pig that, uh, pigs would have traditionally been finished on in Europe or in France or in Canada, a lot of places in the world, they would use barley, which is a real low fat feed compared to corn. Um, is it higher in protein? It, barley, yes. Barley is higher in protein and lower gotcha. in fat than, than corn is. So, um, right. yeah, so that, was, that would have been the classic. And, and, you know, if you read old books, they say that American pork was always finished on corn. And if you read the old books, it says that in European markets, American uh, pork always sold at a discount because th the fat was always soft because it was corn finished and corn can has enough linoleic acid in it that it makes significantly softer pork that you can, you know, if you've ever compared corn versus barley finished pork side by side, you can really tell the difference if you know what you're looking for. Um, in this mm -hmm. case, the diet I'm feeding is even lower in fat than barley finished pork. So I'm hoping it's going to be very firm, but we'll have it in hand soon. <laughs> right. Exciting. So, and one of the, the reasons why you expect the fat to be kind of hard at room temperature or, or not as soft is not only, it's because when you're going through de novo lipogenesis, you have uh, more conversion to a saturated kind of fat, right? If I was understanding right. your... Yes. So de novo lipogenesis, really the, the primary um, thing that is made in de novo lipogenesis is palmitic acid, which is a 16 carbon length saturated fat. That is, that's the end product of de novo lipogenesis, which is, just to clarify, de novo lipogenesis is when you make your own fat from starch or uh, sugar, or alcohol, um, any of the different things that one can, you know, any of the ways you can basically get calories that aren't fat and typically not protein um, can be made into palmitic acid via de novo lipogenesis. And then what happens is um, the proportion of it that ends up as um, well, mostly oleic acid, which is a monounsaturated fat, uh, depends on two enzymes. One is an elongase, which converts it from a 16 carbon length fat into an 18 carbon length fat. And then a second one, which is um, SCD1, so steroid. Um, I'm going to bother. Coa desaturated one. Yeah, yeah coa desaturated. 
it's the rate limiting enzyme. And so what that does is it converts. So the elongase converts it from palmitic acid into stearic acid, and then SCD1 converts it into oleic acid, which is an 18 carbon length uh, monounsaturated fat. And, and the monounsaturated fat is, I mean, you know, think of olive oil is um, a liquid at room temperature. And so that softens the fat somewhat. And so um, in, you know, the classic, well, these pigs, like I said, I haven't actually touched it yet, the, the, the fat, but it yeah. should be a roughly 50-50 blend of saturated fat and monounsaturated fat and have, you know, I'm hoping for under or well under 5% of polyunsaturated fat in it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'll be sending it out for testing soon and we'll see. Yeah, that'll be really interesting to see. I can't wait to have that picture where you can compare the uh, industrial bacon and, uh, and, and, and your bacon. I think it's going to be very telling because I think you, you'd sent me a picture already where someone was holding it and you could see that it, there was some rigidity to it. And, and when I saw that picture, I was like, damn, I think I noticed that in bacon I've bought before but never paid attention to it. Right, um, right. And once you see it, you can't unsee it anymore, you know, when you're in the shop. And if the <laughs> exactly. slices aren't too thin, of course, if they're paper thin, then it's always going to be kind of floppy. But right. if it's pretty regularly cut, then you can, you can really tell. And, you know, I, I was in uh, Madrid this past, uh, this past year in 2019. So I got, I got to, you know, go through all the kinds of hams they have. And it was just amazing to see that, you know, it, it does this thing where it's, it's sweaty where the meat is, is sweating, you know, it's fat, yet it's, it's, it's rigid. And I was always curious as to how that they attained the balance because it is relatively low proof uh, um, uh, ham, right? Like the Serrano and the Bellotta and, and those kinds of ham. Like they're not. Yeah, they should be. And, and so the other, you know, another major difference is the genetics. And so, um, <laughs> the old fashioned pigs um, who, well, <laughs> it's multifaceted, but the old fashioned pigs do a lot more um, de novo lipogenesis than the modern lean pigs. That's actually the trick mm -hmm. that um, they didn't do this on purpose, but in the nineties in Amer you know, when Americans were breeding for quote, the other white meat, as they called it, uh, they were just doing traditional genetic selection for leaner and leaner and leaner pigs. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it turns out what they did in retrospect, when they looked at it was uh, they were selecting for pigs that were basically incapable of doing de novo lipogenesis. And so they couldn't really, I mean, they could do a little bit of it, but, but very inefficient at, at creating their own fat from starch, which meant that, um, you know, they were sort of forced to get the, the oil from their diet. And, mm -hmm. and I've raised some of those pigs and it doesn't matter what you feed them. The fat yeah. is always soft because they Amazing. can't, they can't make, I, and because I mean, I literally raised them side by side in the same field with, you know, more old fashioned pig genetics. Um, and they just literally, the fat never gets firm. It, just, it doesn't matter what you feed them. It's right. always going to be, it's always going to be oily on those pigs. And so, so the older fashioned pigs um, can, um, right, they're going to do more de novo lipogenesis. So they're, they're going to have a much lower percentage of polyunsaturated fat because they get a lot less fat from their mm -hmm. diet, right? And so, so their fat's going to be a blend of saturated and monounsaturated fat. But interestingly, the ones who are really good at storing fat and like, um, so this would be something like the um, the black pigs in Spain. Uh, I'm spacing yeah. on the uh, spacing on the the breed name at the moment, but um, yeah, I, the, I, I the, the Iberico, the the Iberico I, Iberian, pigs, Iberian, yeah, yeah, right. And so those pigs put on um, a much higher percentage of monounsaturated fat, um, or the Mangalitsas do this as well. P pigs that will mm. put on like several inches of back fat, old fashioned, what they would call lard pigs. Um, those pigs have a lot higher ratio of monounsaturated to saturated fat because they make a lot more of 
the SCD one. <laughs> and that's sort of part of the, you know, part of what led me to recently publish the SCD one theory of obesity is, is, you know, noticing time and time again, that the fattier the breed of pig it is, the higher percentage of unsaturated mm -hmm. fats they store on their body. Um, right, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is there a genetic uh, component within those breeds where we see a difference in the extracellular versus intracellular storage of fat? Um, it, it, it's my understanding that there's a difference in those hams where there's the fat percentage is not necessarily visible in the classical way that we expect it, where there's the meat and then the fat. You can see actually more more intracellular marbling. It, it, is that part oh, of the Oh, intramuscular, or? you mean? Yeah, intramuscular. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. And so, um, so any, basically, um, <laughs> it turns out that the amount of unsaturation in any tissue is a switch to store fat. Um, so if you take a, uh, you know, there was a paper where they took, um, they took heart muscle cells, um, pretty sure that's what they were. And, you know, they had them in a, in a culture dish. And um, if they overexpressed SCD1 in those heart muscle mm -hmm. cells, And so SCD1 is the gene that turns saturated fat into monounsaturated fat. So if you overexpress SCD1 in those cells, that was actually sufficient for them to just take in fat and store it in, in a tissue culture. Um, you know, they put palmitic acid in the solution. And as long as they can unsaturate it, they will continue to take in more fat and store it. So actually un unsaturating your fat seems to be sufficient um, to allow you to store more. Mm -hmm. And so, right. So pigs that, that are, are good at this and make a lot of SCD one, they're going to store more fat on their back, but they're also going to store more fat in their muscle, muscle tissues and have more marbling. Mm -hmm. um, and you see, and this is true. This is true in cattle as well as pigs. Um, you know, when you look at the, and especially if you look at the fat composition, of like Wagyu cattle, which make the, um, um, what are they, the, 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 I can't remember, I'm trying to think of the, there's a Japanese name, maybe it's just Wagyu, mm -hmm. but, but Wagyu beef is the, is a breed of cattle that makes really, really highly marbled muscle. So they store a lot of fat in their muscle mm -hmm. tissue. And, and the fat, if you look at the, the fat of that marbled tissue, it's, it's highly monounsaturated. Um, mm. So the Wagyu make a lot more SCD1 in their muscle tissue than do, um, you know, a Holstein or other breeds of cattle. And that's what causes them to have the, the marbling is the SCD1 is like a signal to them to store more fat in their muscles. Okay. So, so would that, so do you think that's gonna, that's gonna become apparent, this difference Um, will we be able to see that in a diabetic versus uh, uh, elite athlete who are both going to have intracellular fat accumulation? Are we going to see a difference in SCD1 between the both yeah, of them? So, so yeah, so if you look at, um, if you look at uh, obese people, um, there's, there is a direct correlation between uh, BMI and SCD1. Um, and it's, and it's like a, it's a dramatic direct correlation. You know what I mean? It's not like, it's like the, you know, they have the, the correlation scores. If you ever look at them, they go from like zero to one, one would be like a, one would be like perfect a perfect point. linear correlation. Right. And the correlation between um, BMI and the level of SCD one is like a 0.7, which is like, one of the mm -hmm. highest correlation scores I've ever seen in a natural system, you know, right. um, there is a thing and, and I need to look at it in very late stage diabetics. I think they, they stop producing SCD one altogether, but I think that has to do with like 
Like insulin failure, probably. Real oxidative stress. All right. Much further along the course of the disease, and that's probably a whole different. There's all kinds all right. of different things happening at that point, but um, yeah. but yeah, if you look at people that are more or less metabolically healthy, there's a very strong correlation between obesity and an SCD1. Yeah, and so th this brings me, so an, one other thing that um, I was reading in your blog post was you were talking about the role of leptin and uh, yes. SCD1 and um, basically uh, non-shivering induced thermogenesis, which is when you use the uncoupling proteins within your mitochondria to produce heat, uh, amongst other things. So that got me thinking. So the, the first thing that came to my mind, because I'm a... a, a you know, uh, basically, I like to torture myself with cold baths. I'm, I'm, I'm that guy. And uh, <laughs> sure. of course, you learn about thermo, uh, you know, um, cold thermogenesis very uh, palpably when you're actually practicing it, and you you realize that you can really change your state very quickly uh, within right. a matter of, you know, maybe less than a minute if you go high if you do hypercapnic uh, hyper uh, hyperventilation, you can start. Right that uncoupling process fast and i thought okay if there's a way to do this repeated uh, repeatedly measurably um how come how come i don't see this translating into any weight loss strategy is it just because inducing it in that manner is too uncomfortable and no one's going to do it or is it because in doing this uncoupling you're going to have a homeostatic adjustment on the other side where I'm going to store more fat for, for, for example, you think you can, you, we're going to see this with, with leptin and, and SCD one where you might have an increase in uncoupling, but essentially you have an increased storage and homeostatic feedback on the other side. You think that mechanism is prone to that? I, I think, I think that, I think the mechanism is prone to that. And, and I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's twofold. I think that, you need, so it looks to me like the mechanism, um, if we just back up for a second. Yes. So yeah. uncoupling protein, what it does is it basically, um, your mitochondria is like a little, like a little battery and it, and it pumps protons across this membrane and it creates a positive charge on the outside and a negative charge on the inside. And then when the, the protons run back down, and basically generates ATP and allows you to store um, the energy from fuels like glucose and fat as, as ATP that your muscles use, et cetera. Um, and so, but it's all based on that charge across the mitochondrial membrane, right? And so what uncoupling protein does is it basically short circuits that and it allows the, the protons to run down without making any ATP. It just generates heat. Right. It's like an exhaust it's, valve. It's like an exhaust valve. Yeah. It just releases the pressure and, and it does so by just, you know, like I said, just generating heat instead of storing the energy. So, so it, it, it basically, it increases your, your metabolic rate. Um, you know, if you make a lot of uncoupling protein, what happens is you burn through a lot more calories without doing any, you know, without doing any extra work. And so, um, so you can see in these, you know, it's very clear in rodent models because they're easier to study than humans are. Um, you know, the, the classic one that I talk about in the paper was in the mid nineties, uh, people discovered leptin, right? And they realized that if you, if you took a mouse and if a mouse didn't have any leptin, they would get very fat and their metabolic rate would decrease and their body temperature would drop. And so you have these mice, which are, they're eating a lot because, so leptin, I would argue has multiple functions. One, and the one that everybody talks about is it signals um, satiety in the hypothalamus. But, but it turns out that if you, um, if you take a mouse that doesn't, have leptin but also doesn't have scd1 which is the you know the gene that allows you to unsaturate your fat um it's something like 
you know, maybe 85% of the function of leptin is returned if the mice also doesn't, don't have SCD1. I don't know if I explained that very clearly. But. No, that's very clear. And it's kind of amazing. <laughs> it's kind of amazing that you've got this, this backup. You know, it's, it's maybe not the right way to see it as a backup, but you've got this, these dual ways of, of regulating uh, body well, weight. Well, and so, and so I would argue that it's not really a backup system. I would argue that the function of leptin is the down regulation of SCD1. So leptin, okay. leptin is, a, is a strong down regulator. I would argue it's the dominant down regulator of SCD1. So most of the function of leptin is to turn off SCD1 and therefore make your fat more saturated. Um, it, yes, it also acts in the hypothalamus, yeah. but, <laughs> but I would argue that 75% of its function is the direct right. down regulation of SCD1. And what's interesting about that is the mechanism by which leptin seems to down regulate SCD1 is it increases, um, the level of another protein called CPT1, which is essentially the, um, the, the rate limiting enzyme uh, that allows fat to enter the mitochondria and start doing beta oxidation and, and then the Krebs cycle. And so basically leptin turns on fat burning, right? It increase, it literally increases the rate that fat is entering the mitochondria. And what that does is it creates um, the active oxygen species. Um, and that's, a complicated thing. Let's for now just assume that's true and we go back to it. Um, and the, the reactive oxygen species, when they're being produced, um, they stimulate two different signaling pathways. One of them is, uh, well, one of them is NRF2, which is a transcription factor, which directly down regulates SCD1. Um, the other one is, a, is something called um, ERK1 slash two, I don't know why it's named like that, um, which stimulates MAP kinase. And that's a second pathway that's directly stimulated by reactive oxygen species that also downregulates SCD1. So basically, when leptin is signaling, the rate of fat oxidation is increased, that creates ROS. The ROS stimulates these two different uh, pathways which both directly downregulate SCD1. And so what that sets up is it sets up this kind of positive feedback loop because um, saturated fat, when it goes into the mitochondria, creates more reactive oxygen species than do unsaturated fats. Um, and so, so what's happening is when you gain weight, so you make more leptin when you gain weight. So what's, what's sort of supposed to happen is, okay, so I've gained a bunch of weight or I've gained some weight. Um, now I have more leptin. That means that my, um, you know, I'm going to start burning more fat. And when I burn more fat, I'm going to make more reactive oxygen species. When I do that, SCD1 is going to be turned down so that if I'm eating um, starch or if I'm consuming alcohol, um, that means that when I do de novo lipogenesis, I'm going to be making saturated fat, right? Because if SCD1 is not being produced, I have no way to unsaturate the saturated fat that I make through de novo lipogenesis, which means that over time, my fat is going to become more and more saturated. That's going to make even more ROS. Um, and ultimately, and if you make enough ROS, then what happens is uh, uncoupling proteins are produced, um, like we talked about, and your metabolic rate increases. So it's kind of a positive feedback loop where, you know, leptin is causing ROS to be generated, which causes your fat to become more saturated, which makes even more ROS, which ultimately forces your metabolic rate to increase by, by uh, upregulating these uncoupling proteins. And this is, you can see this very clearly in rodent models, you know, they, they literally, they take these mice. Um, you can see the ones that don't have, 
uh, leptin, like I say, and they, they, they somehow put them in these calorimeters and you can see how many calories they're burning. You can see oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. And then when you remove the SCD1, you know, their metabolic rate goes up 40%. Um, there's one paper and I'm super amused by this. Um, <laughs> remember the technology they were using some technology it might have been a knockout mice where they were lacking scd1 or there's different ways they have an anti-sense way of knocking out scd1 but these mice had something that they called um hypermetabolic wasting disorder so like these mice weren't making scd1 and their metabolic rate was so high that the mice literally couldn't eat enough to oh, wow maintain their fat status you know they had six packs and they just couldn't you know so if you can't unsaturate your fat you can't store fat and and you can see this all the way back in c elegans so c elegans who lack a functional scd1 gene um they can't store fat either um you know when you look at the c elegans they they don't have a specialized fat tissue but they store a little um droplets of fat within their cells and so that's one of the papers that i reference you know if if they don't have scd1 um they can't store fat uh so unless you give them a source of of monounsaturated fat in their diet then giving them monounsaturated fat allows them to store body fat but if they can't get monounsaturated fat either from their diet or through scd1 they basically are unable to store fat. Um, they and the mechanism is LA, right? Right. Yes. Oh, I mean, they didn't actually. I, I've never seen that experiment done, but presumably, okay. given linoleic acid, would also allow them to store fat. Although, I don't know that that experiment mm. has actually been done. But yeah. Yeah, that that would be interesting to see. Um, yeah. So so that's interesting because. Okay, so the obvious question is, is uh, olive oil fattening then, right? That's the natural. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so, and so I actually, and so since that's the question that I get the most right. often, um, exactly. that was actually my most recent post. And, and, and the answer to that is actually really interesting. Um, so if you, if you believe in, you know, what I've called the SCD1 theory of obesity, the idea that your fat, has to be to store fat your fat has to be unsaturated to a certain level right and if you're the more unsaturated your fat is the better you are at storing fat and that um that is basically the idea and so if you can get your fat to be really saturated you will your metabolic rate will increase you'll make more uncoupling protein and in theory uh, that will help you lose weight. That's, that's the basic idea, right, of the theory. And so um, going back to your question, which I've now forgotten. Um, the, the olive oil. The olive oil, <laughs> olive oil right, right. Yeah. So olive oil is really interesting. Um, so if you were to, to take olive oil, you know, when we, a really interesting question is, okay, our stored body fat, where does it come from, you know? Um, if, if a person makes, eats only starch, their body fat, you know, by definition has to be made through de novo lipogenesis from the starch. But if you're consuming a fair percentage of your diet as fat, um, so, you know, uh, an American or a French person, most of your body fat ultimately is derived from dietary fat because um, your body doesn't do de novo lipogenesis if it doesn't have to. Um, and so, but if you were to store olive oil directly, that wouldn't work. That's way too unsaturated for like, you can't, that would it'd be a bad idea to store that directly. Right. And, and no human has, if you look at human fat, no human fat is nearly, as unsaturated as olive oil. And so the body knows like, okay, 
that's too unsaturated. So what, so what does it do? Well, it turns out that there's, a, there's something called OEA, which is made in your small intestine when you consume monounsaturated fat. And its effects are really interesting. It basically is doing three things. Um, one is it suppressing your appetite, which is your body's way of saying like, okay, that's really unsaturated, stop eating. <laughs> and two, it, um, it increases kind of like flux through the whole system. Um, what happens is fat cells start doing more lipolysis, which is when they release fat for the rest of the body. Um, so fat cells start releasing fat, um, but they also start taking in more fat and they also start sending more fat into the mitochondria and the liver starts doing de novo lipogenesis and starts exporting more fat. So all at once in response to this OEA, um, fat burning is increased, fat release is increased, fat production is increased. And the other thing that OEA does is it suppresses SCD1. So there's SCD1 again. And so what happens is the liver is, is effectively um, creating a bunch of saturated fat via de novo lipogenesis and it's exporting it. And it's um, as, as your dietary fat is distributed throughout the body, um, that happens in these uh, chylomicrons or perhaps cliomicrons. I can never quite remember. I think it's chylo. <laughs> anyway, yeah, correct. Um, <laughs> right. So, so as, you're, as, the, as the fat from your meal is coming in and is being distributed to all these fat tissues, basically a lot of it, uh, quote, spills into the bloodstream as it's being transferred into cells and becomes free fatty acids, which is like how the fat circulates through the blood. And, and the liver is actually taking in these, these free fatty acids, which is the olive oil from the meal, and it's making palmitic acid and it's making stearic acid and it's turning these free fatty acids back into triglycerides and it's packing them into these uh, VLDL molecules and then, and then it exports those. So those go back into the bloodstream. And so you have this kind of, I don't know, cyclical thing where, where the liver is saying like, okay, dietary fat's coming in. It's very unsaturated. So we're going to make a bunch of saturated fat to increase, sort of increase the octane of the blend, right? Before we, before we store it. And as long as, as long as there, that OEA is around, you know, the whole system is just kind of cranking because it, cause it's, it wants to, it wants to get that fat more saturated before it's safe to store basically. Um, okay. So yeah, you've so got that, a nice closed loop auto regulating system for fat storage uh, right. with OEA responding. But what is OEA responding to exactly? Monounsaturated right. fat or, yes. or something? Yes. Else? So OEA is made from oleic acid. So, right. so monounsaturated fat is the starting point of OEA and it's made in your small intestine. So you eat okay, a, it's a meal of olive okay. oil. You, it's a, right. It's a metabolite of olive oil or of monounsaturated fat. So it, you're, okay. you're, you know, you eat a bunch of monounsaturated fat, your small intestine starts making OEA and that kicks off the whole cycle. Okay. Okay. So probably not. So bone marrow is delicious, but not the, the most slimming of, of fats when compared to a more saturated fat, uh, despite, but despite the OEA autoregulatory feedback, you think? Yeah. Well, but, I, I, I think that, I mean, no, I, I think bone marrow is probably, bone marrow is a really good example. I, I like it obviously because we know that humans have been eating bone marrow for hundreds of thousands of years, certainly mm -hmm. probably millions of years. And so it's a good example because it has a lot of other, um, uh, a lot of other things in bone marrow are direct mm -hmm. suppressors of SCD1 as well, including uh, conjugated linoleic acid and right. palmitoleic acid. And I, there's probably more of, of these long chain unsaturates, but, but so SCD one, when it, 
when the body sees a lot of highly unsaturated fats coming in, um, including polyunsaturated fats, but especially things like CLA, um, it says, okay, um, we have a plentiful source of dietary fat. It's already unsaturated. We don't need to make SCD1 anymore. And so Mm -hmm. the body turns it off. And so, um, you know, bone marrow seems to be something that's pretty well regulated. And, you know, I argue in the last post that humans for a long time have been eating bone marrow, but they've probably also been eating starchy tubers for a long time. Um, And so what I argue is that the, the starchy tubers are basically the substrate that allows um, humans to do the de novo lipogenesis in response to the meal of bone marrow. And, and that is the, the blood glucose essentially is the starting point to, to saturate the bone marrow, if that makes sense. Um, Now the question is, and I don't know the answer to this. And I asked it at the end of the article is, can we, (laughs) uh, if you were to eat just bone marrow alone, can we break the monounsaturated fat all the way down to acetyl-CoA and then rebuild it into palmitic acid, which is saturated, and store it that way? And I don't know the answer. Can we do that? I don't know. Neither do I. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, so that's, that's future, research. It's future research, but... But yeah, mm-hmm. I, guess what I, w- I guess what I would argue is that in a properly functioned human physiology, I don't see anything wrong with eating monounsaturated fat. But, um, you know, if you're obese, if you're struggling with your weight, I would cut it out personally. Uh, you know, I don't, I try to avoid monounsaturated fat as well as avoiding polyunsaturated fats. Um, right. and you know, I'm hoping to get down to my target weight over this winter, but we'll see what happens. Um, I've been steadily, I've been steadily working on saturating my body fat with the idea that this will, you know, enhance weight loss, uh, in the coming months. <laughs> and, and you've got some sort of, uh, what, what was it? A red blood cell membrane a saturation index measurement? It, was that it? Yes, or? yes. And so What's if that? you look at the studies that have been done on SED1, um, people talk about the desaturase index. And so this is just, you can do it with either oleic acid or palmitic acid, but it's just uh, a monounsaturated fat divided by saturated fat. Um, the one that I talk about most is the um, is oleic acid divided by stearic acid. And that is, um, you could use either one. I like that one because I think that the oleic acid is more commonly uh, sort of the issue, basically, if you're overweight and your people who are overweight have lots of oleic acid. So I think that's more the problem. The palmitic acid is a much smaller role in all of this. Um, And so that is the, you know, just, a, just like, so for instance, when I did my first test, I had like 24% of my membrane fat was oleic acid and like one to 2% was palmitic acid. So, so humans don't store a lot of palmitic or palmitic oleic acid. It's a relatively small player that that's the monounsaturated 16 length fat that would be made from palmitic acid. So it goes from palmitic to palmitic and it goes from uh, steric to oleic. Um, anyway, so, right. So when I did that test, my, I had twice as much, um, more than twice as much oleic acid as I had steric acid. And that is, well, (laughs) the, the, unfortunately the people who do this test are not super forthcoming about exactly Mm -hmm. what, fats they're met they say that they have this pri- proprietary algorithm or whatever method that allows them to to just be measuring i think the membranes of the red blood cells and i wish they were more forthcoming about exactly how the test works 
I like the test because it's easy. They send mm -hmm. you, um, they send you a kit in the mail. It's a, you know, you do a finger prick, you make a little blood spot, you put it back in the mail and you get the result in a week. So, you know, you don't have to go in and have a blood draw done. Um, so it's really convenient, which is, which is great. Um, but I wish they told us a little more about how, <laughs> what exactly is right. being tested. But when we look at, so um, when you look at people whose red blood cell membranes were tested in like the China health study. So, and if you look at that study, not, not the, not the little paperback written by T. Colin Campbell, but the initial study, which is like this mm -hmm. thousand page monogram of data is one of my favorite. I just spent on my coffee table for like literally 20 years. I just flip through it and look at the correlations. But um, anyway, those people had more stearic acid in their red blood cell membranes than they had oleic acid. So their desaturates input it desaturase index was like 0 0.9 and mine is like 2.1. And that's interesting because, um, <laughs> so, okay. So what does that mean? That means that all of us in the, in the West who have been consuming all of this saturated fat, our body fat is much more unsaturated than people living in China eating starch. So the effect of eating meat, ironically, is that your fat is less saturated. Yeah, so well, that's well, kind of a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's quite fitting, I would say, I would say with what you suggested, but what came to my mind was that what are you going to find when you compare a skinny fat person with a obese person? Yeah. And I don't know. That's a really good question. And I, I don't know what the answer is. And, and obviously, you know, we know that, you know, just by existing in the world as an American, we can see that some people um, stay quite lean on the, you know, standard American diet and some people get very obese and obviously something is different about them and I don't know what it is, but, um, but that would be a really interesting thing to look into. And I don't, yeah, I'm not definitely. sure. Because it's, yeah. it's a, already an interesting, uh, I would say uh, three sets of figures that you, you have with yourself, uh, the a a Asian uh, population. And what was the third one? There was uh, one the third one I, was just a, uh, a friend of yours, right? Uh, just a, a, a Twitter friend, I guess. But, um, gotcha. you know, he's yeah. someone who yeah. had had the same test done, uh, someone right. who'd never been obese and was basically eating a, a carnivore diet. Um, and mm -hmm. he posted his oh, numbers. Oh, Nathan Owens, right? It was Nathan. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Nathan. Okay. And so he posted yeah, yeah, his yeah. numbers. And so that was just the only other comparison that I had at the time that right. I wrote the article. <laughs> and so the, right. So the, so the Chinese um, people eating starch were at like 0 0.9 and Nathan was at like 1.6 and I was at like 2.1, you know, and that right. kind of shows the spectrum of results that I've seen. And since then, a lot of people have sent me results and, you know, that seems pretty like, uh, you know, I think Toshi Clark was like a 1.54 or something like that. And, and somebody just gotcha. posted, posted who was like a 1.2 which is really low and so but but that but that was a german testing company and i don't know mm. if yeah. they're using the same protocol to come up with a number so i don't know if it's directly comparable but that was yeah. interesting yeah. to see that that report yeah that's yeah. interesting that's that's definitely worth hunting down have a few people compare it from the same lab um right have have some basic food tracking from like seven days previous or something just to to get an estimate of, of what's in there. That'd be really interesting to, to do. Um, yeah. But yeah, I wanted to, to, to go to a more general point uh, to take a step back because we've, I, love, I love being in the weeds, but I also like to take a sure. step back and, and ask you quite simply, uh, what do you think about this? Um, there's two ways for me that you can fatten a person, uh, sure. essentially. 
And you can hit it, you can basically hit ins insulin signaling in two places. So you can, I would say, increase the amount of total insulin via hyperinsulinemia. So that's your insulin injections, that's your fast absorbing sugars, uh, refined uh, flours, that sort of stuff, right? That's one way right. you, can, you can create hyperinsulinemia. The other way is to uh, fuck with the fat cell, right? <laughs> using right. The, the right kind of fats. You can start using a ton of linoleic acid. You're gonna get um, basically inappropriate uh, reactive oxygen species signaling, which is not going to go and phosphorylate the RS1 receptor, which, is, which means insulin is gonna allow entry of substrate into the cell and you're gonna overload the cell. It's not made to, to deal with that amount of fat influx and give a, healthy physiological response when you have an excess of LA. So you can sensitize it and you can jack up the insulin. Those are the two main levers I see to, to fatten someone and of course to slim them down by the same token. And I'm wondering, does that make any sense with the way you see obesity and reversing diabetes? Because of course we've talked previously about the French who eat flour products uh, sugar products as well, um, and you know, seem to remain rel relatively lean according to some FAO stats that we we talked about previously. So I was wondering, does that make sense to you? Does 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 is that congruent with your way of seeing things, or does does something have to give in what I said? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense, and and you know, it. Yeah, and so I think that there's, to me, what seems to be more, um, you know, of those two, of those two routes, the more that I look at it, the more that I'm seeing an almost dominant role of the types of fats stored in the fat cells, you know, that really, sure. and it's not to say that the insulin one, you know, like, so if uh, here's an interesting thing if you take a a relatively healthy human being um i'm gonna say uh uh well i'm forgetting his name the actor um but actors who mm -hmm. fatten up to play a, a role right they'll often um Sylvester Stallone. Sylvester Stallone did this. <laughs> he, uh, he basically, he wanted, he was, he was playing an older cop. Um, he wanted to be fat for the role. And so he literally just like stuffed himself with pancakes. Um, he went to the same, mm -hmm. you know, just ate these huge piles of pancakes day after day, after day, after day, after day. And he was able to fatten up and play the role that he wanted. But, but in that, but that, but it is someone who has this healthy physiology and they're, they're sure they're stuffing themselves up by increasing insulin, extra calories. It's all being stored as fat, but that person is probably storing their fat in a fairly saturated form. Um, and okay. once they stop purposefully uh, fattening themselves, it's pretty easy for them to lose the weight after typically. Um, as opposed to someone who, you know, who got fat by mistake. <laughs> um, and then you look at them and their fat is very unsaturated and they have a hard time losing the weight later. Um, and so it's like, yes, Sylvester Stallone absolutely was fattening himself by hyperinsulinemia and, and just extra calories and starch and, um, and all those things. But, but it's like, his, you know, I talk about in my blog about the post obese phenotype and what you see is, is, and there, there's a really, again, this is a rodent study. Um, but it's very interesting. They, they gave these, these mice quote, the Western diet and, and that which they call saturated and I call very unsaturated, which is basically something like 40% of their calories or 45% of their calories from um, an American source of lard and American lard, because of all the corn the pigs are given and the soybeans is, is quite unsaturated. And then they also have another like 5% of like soybean oil in that diet. So those mm -hmm. mice are getting, you know, 10% of their calories or more from linoleic acid. And it's pretty representative can, of the population level. 
Exactly. Very representative of Americans, at least, and probably most other countries in this day and age. But, um, and so mice fatten really readily on this diet. And what they did was, you know, once the mice hit a certain level of obesity, they took one group of mice and they, um, they gave it a, they gave them a pharmaceutical that, um, that basically totally knocked out their SCD one. And they took a second group of mice and they switched them back over to a very low fat diet, which mice on a very low fat, high starch diet will typically stay lean. Right. And so the mice given a pharmaceutical that knocks out their SCD one rapidly lost the weight and became just like the lean mice. But the mice that were switched back over to the low fat diet, they never lost the weight. They, they didn't continue to gain weight like they would have on the Western diet, but they right. sort of, they wound up in the middle, right? So, so once, once the mice had consumed enough linoleic acid, uh, they were not able to go back to the lean phenotype by going back to the diet that created the other lean mice. Something about them was broken. And when they looked at what was different about those mice that I call post-obese, um, they were making tons and tons of SCD1. So those mice had become, had, due to the, I well, due to, I would argue, the linoleic acid content of their diet had gotten stuck in this obese physiology because uh, they were making way too much SCD1. And so... And, and here's the problem. <laughs> if SCD1, if the thing that downregulates SCD1 mm -hmm. is generation of reactive oxygen species, and if the thing that creates the reactive oxygen species is saturated fat, now you've got a situation where once your fat is too unsaturated, you can't generate enough reactive oxygen species to downregulate SCD1, which is to say that going forward, your fat is gonna to continue to be too unsaturated, right? Now you've got a positive right. feedback loop again, but it's going in the wrong direction. It's like, you can never get saturated enough to sort of like get back over the mountain, right? You're like, you're stuck. But yeah, yeah, but the, so the implication of what you should do if we take, take it to its logical conclusion and people are going to hate this is you should be <laughs> chugging bulletproof coffee that's super saturated fat <laughs> and clear <laughs> all those unsaturated fats out and basically get your fat flux going and changing up that ratio. Right, exactly, exactly. But, it's, but, but, the, pro, you know, but the problem is if you That's you're, heretical. Well, well, it is heretical, but it's also, <laughs> but it's also true that, you know, the problem that you end up in though, is, is if, if you have a lot of stored unsaturated fat, like even if you're eating a lot of saturated fat and stearic acid, if your if your body is making way too much SCD1 and is just converting it all to oleic acid, then, then you're, you're kind of stuck. Right. And so you, right. You can eat all the saturated fat you want, but if your body just keeps unsaturating it, you know, <laughs> then, you're, then you're stuck. And that's the problem I think, or it's, it's, a it's definitely battle, a big yeah. problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. That's interesting. So it's going to take some sort of MRNA vaccine targeting a CD one. Well, and right. And so, and so, and, and so, and so what I've been doing and the, the thing that um, that I have on the blog now, I'm getting some of it. This is not easy to find, but well, it, it both is and isn't. So uh, there's a tropical nut. Um, it's called a Sterculia nut. Um, it grows pretty much in the tropics all around the world. Uh, it grows in Asia. It grows in Africa. It grows in Mexico. Um, and it has a fat uh, called straculic acid, which actually is a natural inhibitor of SCD1. Um, and, and people eat it. It's a normal food. Like you can buy, you can, if you go to India, you can buy it in, at the, you know, like at the farmer's market, basically. Um, 
So this is a, it seems to be safe because, well, because people consider it food in the tropics, you know, um, this is a very common thing. And so it seems pretty safe. Um, and so I've been taking a little bit of it, um, a teaspoon a day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's helping me to sort of resaturate, as it were, my, you know, my stored fat. And that's slowly working. Um, so I, like I say, my desaturase index, like I had, when I first started, when I first did that test, I had like 23 or 24% stored oleic acid. Um, after six weeks of, you know, a teaspoon a day, um, I was down to like 20%. And my stored stearic acid went from like 10.8% up to like 13 and change. I'd have to look at it. And so, so my desaturase index went from a 2.1 to like a 1.6, um, which is good, which is good. Okay. I'm going in the right direction. And, mm -hmm. and two other things happened within. So I've always had a, a body temperature of around 97, right? Um, which suggests that um, suggests that I'm, my body is not good at doing thermogenesis. Thermogenesis is the process of making heat, and we do it by producing uncoupling proteins, as we've mentioned. And so, so the uncoupling proteins allows you to basically burn off fuel as heat. Um, I've, my whole adult life, my body temperature has been 90, you know, below 97 and a half, let's say. And so within four or five days of taking uh, the sterculic acid for the first time ever, my body temperature became 98.6. So in, um, in Celsius, how much is that? Remind me, 30? Oh, from in Celsius, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, but, uh, but, but 98.6 98 is considered normal. And so I've been okay. about one degree Celsius below that my whole life. And, um, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. And within five days of taking an SD1 inhibitor, my body temperature normalized for the first time ever as an adult. So that was cool. You know, I'm like, okay, this, this maybe, maybe I'm like, maybe I'm onto something here. Maybe I'm going the right direction because, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, well, you know, it's nice when you have a theory and then you try something yeah. and you get an immediate result back. You're like, that was cool. Um, and so, you know, how long? will it take for my and the other thing i did is i have a metabolic testing device and so yeah i was about my to ask you my resting metabolic rate you know i did it several times um sitting on the same couch chilling same um same heart rate same time of day um my resting metabolic rate was 2200 calories per day um, within a week, 10 days perhaps of starting to use a little bit of the sterculic acid, uh, my resting metabolic rate went up to 2,600 calories a day by doing nothing other than that. And so, you know, I think that it is causing some amount of uncoupling protein to be produced um, and so, and, but my question is, how is that going to, how is that going to change over time? Right. And, and is my, the next time I take that blood test, am I going to see that my desaturase index continues to drop over time? And at some point, am I going to get hypermetabolic wasting syndrome where I just simply can't. <laughs> consume enough calories to keep the pounds on <laughs> yeah that, that which is that kind of a joke really which is kind of a joke but also kind of serious <laughs> it's true it reminds me of you know they had dnp on the market years ago which is an uncoupler uh dinitrotrophenol something like that the dnp uncoupler i can't right. remember why it was pulled from the market but it did seem to work so there is precedent right. yeah 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 sure sure right and so i'm i'm simply like basically all that I'm trying to do is give myself the same stored fat ratios that a person 
eating a pure starch diet from birth would have, right? You know, this mm-hmm. is the, the, the heretical thought here. I mean, maybe this is the most heretical, if we're going to be say something heretical, would be that, you know, yes. uh, the primary effect of eating mm-hmm. beef fat is that it makes your fat more unsaturated. I, I, I like the idea because it probably <laughs> just gave three cardiologists a heart attack just hearing that <laughs> sentence. Right, right. But, yeah. but it's true though, compared to starch eating cultures, meat eating cultures, fat is more unsaturated. Yeah. That's a fact, you know? And that's, right. a, that's like you say, I think that's going to be a hard thing for people to wrap their heads yeah. around. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I really like the, uh, I really like that idea. So I wonder, so, so the cocktail would be something that's going to increase uncoupling. Like, right. like what you suggested, uh, something that's going to downregulate SCD one. Right. And something that's going to minimize inappropriate uh, ROS response, which could be linoleic acid, of course. Right, right. And so, and so I suggest a couple other things on the blog. Um, there's a Chinese herb called berberine. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, one thing that does, one thing that does interestingly downregulate SCD1 quite dramatically is, is metformin. And we know right. that metformin has good effects at dealing with, you know, diabetic uh, symptoms and a lot of other things. People like metformin. But there's another Chinese herb called berberine, which has a very mm-hmm. similar effect to metformin at down regulating SCD1 and it seems to do it um well I'd have to look I think it does it by stimulating amp kinase which is different from map kinase confusingly um almost yeah. the same word but different <laughs> different <methods. laughs> right, right. Um, uh and so, so uh, wait, how would metfor- how would metformin do it would it be because if you're taking it as at a physiological dose around what uh, in the the dozens to, to hundred uh, micromolar, it's gonna affect the glycerophosphate shuttle, right? And is that where you think it's affecting ROS and affecting SCD1, or is it I, I another think it's, effect? I think it's a separate effect. I think it is sure. because it's stimulating amp kinase, but you know, I don't know enough about metformin to uh-huh. speak uh-huh. knowledgeably on exactly how metformin is having that effect. But mm-hmm. I know that. Uh, there was a, a a group, I think it was a Chinese research group, and they showed they showed that metformin does indeed uh, reduce SCD1 fairly dramatically, as does berberine. And so um, berberine you can get in the U.S. without a prescription, and it seems to be similarly effective as, um, as metformin at reducing SCD1. And the other thing that SCD1 responds really well to is conjugated linoleic acid. Which is interesting right. because, con- you know, the best dietary source of conjugated linoleic acid or CLA mm-hmm. is dairy products. And when you look right. at traditional cultures around the world, um, such as the French, such as American farmers in 1940, such as um, Asian pastoralists in places like Tibet, you know, they're all combining starch and dairy fat. And so the dairy fat has this CLA in it, which is a natural inhibitor of SCD1. And so it's like, okay, eating starch, eating starch and butter, if uh, that was what your mother ate, and if you were born into that culture, and that's all that you've ever eaten, appears to keep people quite lean. You know, and so that so that's a lot. Big part of my research is thinking about th- that sort of a, a one of the pillars that I kind of like try to work off of is it, it, when you look around the world at cultures, it seems that yeah. starch eating cultures tend to stay lean. You know, cultures that eat starch and butter tend to stay lean, but cultures that eat starch and vegetable oil tend to become obese. Um, so that right. was sort of, that's the starting point of my theory. And, you know, maybe so I have something it, about so, that wrong. I don't know, but it's, so the, the 
first question that comes to my mind is, are you going to get this, basically the observation from what keeps a population non-obese? Is that applicable for someone who is already obese and who needs then to reverse that? Right. And that is, and that's the question. And that's, that's sort of the million yeah. dollar question. And, and so right. when I looked at, um, right. And so when I looked at that mouse study that I talked about where they, where one group was given the SCD1 inhibitor and the other group was switched back to the old diet and they stayed, they stayed obese. That was, sort of a light bulb moment for me of saying like, yes, it's mm -hmm. the, you know, and those mice continued to over express SCD one and overproduce SCD one and they stayed fat. And that was, you know, a definite Eureka moment for me looking at that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also like, one more. holy shit, holy shit. That could be right. bad news though. Like, like this could be really bad news. Right. No, it's, it's kind, it's kind of bad news, but it's also, it's also good in the sense that, well, if we know that's the problem, <laughs> then we should sure, start sure. thinking about ways yeah, to fix enough. it, right? Um, yeah, fair enough. And, 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 I, and so, I'm not sure if I want you to be right or not. I'm conflicted. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Right, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and so, so I'll, I'll throw one more example. And this is, this is breaking yeah. news because um, I haven't talked about it yet. But um, so there's, a, there's a, something called the PPAR gamma, which is another... Um, transcription factor and so it turns on all these different genes and um one of the things it does is it upregulates scd1 and so um there is a uh forgetting the name but proglitazone maybe mm -hmm. is a drug that is given to uh people with diabetes and it reduces diabetes syndrome, or it, it, it reduces the symptoms of diabetes, and it makes people fat. So when you give people this drug, uh, it's stimulating this PPAR gamma, and their SCD1 levels go up by something like 70%, and they gain a lot of weight very quickly, and that ends up reducing symptoms of diabetes, probably because, it, you know, instead of having all of these circulating free fatty acids, they're storing it as yeah. fat, right? And so that's probably- Yeah, they it, it, recapitulated with the injectable insulin. You just store it away in fat rather than getting it to circulate. Right, exactly. And so you can do the same thing with this drug that increases SCD1. You end up with the exact same effect as you would by increasing insulin. And oh, by the way, insulin also directly increases SCD1. And so you see this battle, in the long term, you see this battle playing out between insulin and leptin, where insulin is increasing SCD1 and leptin is trying to turn it off. And the problem is leptin stops working once, um, once your fat is insufficiently saturated to produce that mm -hmm. ROS response, you know, that's the, the point I think at which leptin breaks and stops functioning. And so people talk about leptin resistance all the time. I think leptin resistance is just simply caused by your stored fat being too unsaturated. Um, mm -hmm. it, because leptin, you know, the way that leptin works is by unleashing that wave of ROS, which ends up stimulating NRF2 and NRF2 is what allows the uncoupling protein to be NRF2 when it's stimulated causes uncoupling proteins to be produced right and so if you can't drive enough ROS you cannot um, NRF2 has an inhibitor which is um, which is basically knocked out by the ROS so if you make enough ROS, you knock out the SCD1 inhibitor or the, the NRF2 inhibitor, and NRF2 goes into the mitochondria or into the nucleus and it forms, it causes uncoupling proteins to be produced. And that's what allows you to do the thermogenesis that the leptin is stimulating. And so if you eat too much linoleic acid or if you produce too much oleic acid, you can no longer 
generate that wave of ROS that the leptin is supposed to induce. Um, and it's then the whole system stops working. That's, that's, you know, that's the heart of the theory, I, I guess. Um, and this is entirely testable as well. This is very, very testable in a lot of trials yeah. that are already happening. Well, right. And, and so, what, so what's really, okay. So if we back up for a second, what's really interesting about this is there's tons of research done on this between like 2005 and 2011. There's like 30 papers on this all, you know, mostly all done in rodent studies, but, um, you know, this is all really well worked out. I mean, you can look at these papers and they can show, yeah. yes, if we, if we, use an antisense inhibitor to, to block SCD1 production in these mice. Um, mm -hmm. they, they make more uncoupling protein, their metabolic rate goes up, and they stay lean. So there's literally 30 papers in rodents that show this all very clearly and very dramatically. And then what happened in 2010 is <laughs> they did this one study, and I, I need to look, that's actually on my list of things to do this week. Um, they did a study where they took these mice and the mice were blocked from making SCD1. Um, they didn't have a, uh, an LDL receptor. So, you know, they had this buildup of oxidized cholesterol because they couldn't mm -hmm you know, they, they didn't have an LDL receptor, so they couldn't recycle the floating cholesterol. And they probably also were given a highly monounsaturated fat deficient diet. They were probably on a low fat diet. And so, so these mice blocking SCD1 increased the amount of atherosclerosis, right? Which kind of makes sense because if you've got a system where um, if you've got a system where you've got a lot of circulating cholesterol with a chance to oxidize and you're doing something that's going to increase the amount of ROS, that's an, that, right. That's like a perfect scenario. You say, yes, in that specific scenario, uh, you probably want more monounsaturated fat. Like you know, the body is always trying to get to a state of balance. Right. And so, um, if you eat something like starch, starch can only be turned into saturated fat. And so when you eat a pure starch diet, you want to make a little more SCD1. And that's what happens. That's what people do because that allows you to store your fat in this kind of sweet spot of, you know, roughly half saturated, roughly half, uh, monounsaturated and, and very small amount of polyunsaturated fat, right? So if you eat highly, highly saturated fat or starch, your body will make a little more SCD1 to get into the middle. And if you um, eat, if you eat a lot of bone marrow or other sources of monounsaturated fat, your body shuts off SCD1 production because again, it's it's trying, it's trying to get back to the middle, right? It's like, if you eat over here, all this starch, you're making saturated fat, your body makes more SCD1 to get here. And if you're eating over here, a lot of monounsaturated fat, your body makes, uh, shuts down SCD1 product production to again, get you back to the middle, right? And so in this mouse study, the mice were like way over here. They were not given monounsaturated, much monounsaturated fat in their diet, although they might've done that later. Um, but they were not able to make SCD1 and they also didn't have an LDL receptor. And so in that specific case, it, it was, you know, the result of this was bad. And so basically after that study came out, I think that when I look at the literature, and so then in 2012, like all the research on SCD1 just stops after the study came out. And I think that the researchers we're probably already struggling working in mainstream medical research going like, well, it seems like if the mice only can make saturated fat, they get really lean. And the more unsaturated fat that we give them, they get fat. And we Cut can do down. this. We can reproduce this time and time again, but 
ah, uh, how do we explain that to our peers and how do we get funding? You know what I mean? Let's, it, not, let, let's not explain it to our peers. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. And so it was really, it was this really hot area, you know, and they had just discovered yeah. leptin. And then they discovered that, that if you knock out SCD1 in a mouse that doesn't have leptin, you know, the mouse almost goes back to being normal. And so they're like, okay, well, clearly leptin and this SCD1 are very interrelated and that's very important. And they did all this research and then they just dropped it all and walked away right around 2011 or 2012. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so there's a, there's, a ton, there's a ton of research from back then and then it just stops. And I think, I think that's exactly what it was. They were like, well, we, we can't, yeah. How, how are we going to explain to our peers that the, that, that the whole problem with obesity is that our fat is too unsaturated, you know, uh, right. back in 2012, even when obviously, you know, people were already talking about the, you know, keto and saturated fat being good, but way more on the fringe than it even is now. Right. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind so, of anyways. interesting though, how, how it fits with, I think it broadly speaking, it does fit with the evolutionary perspective, because if you think of the sort of fat ratios you were likely to find in nature uh, throughout most of the Pleistocene, as we got progressively more carnivorous with our technology and sophisticated sure. in our hunting, you know, we had all these ruminant, very large animals that presented these, these, you know, massive amounts of available bone marrow of brains of, uh, you know, a lot of fat around the organs in those animals. Yeah. I mean, you get a right. shit ton of stearic acid from a oh. mammoth or, so, or something else. Right. The, the, the kidney fat or the internal organ fat is the most saturated yeah. fat, at least in a ruminant. Um, I haven't found a lot of data about other types of animals, but in ruminants mm -hmm. anyways, that, that body cavity fat is highly, highly saturated. Yeah. Um, so, and, and you get this, this impression that if you somehow if you, you can basically navigate a whole carcass in terms of the fatty acid composition and certain plants that remain not too high in linoleic acid and your body can use that SCD1 switch to sort of regulate the amount of fat saturation it wants. But as soon as you leave those evolutionary parameters and introduce machinery, I think it's in the late, uh, 1800, uh, late uh, 1700s, I think thereabouts that the first machines for cottonseed were introduced and maybe 80 right. years later, they were becoming actually sufficiently large to become an industrial thing. And therein lies the problem where you start getting outside of those parameters where the body can't regulate homeostatically as it usually would. Uh, interesting. So it's actually happening peripherally, according to your theory, which is completely different than the mainstream obesity view of everything being a reward factor in the brain, for example. So this is right. back to old school peripheral, you know, homeostatic sensing, which is really interesting, I think. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the way I like to think about it is, you know, if, if you're going to have a theory of obesity, the, of the root cause of the, like you say, it, it's different. Uh, the thing that causes obesity in the first place and what you then have to do once you're obese might be two very different things, right? Like they don't necessarily have to be the same, but if you're going to have a theory of obesity that gets at the root causes of obesity and what initially made someone obese, right. I think your theory has to incorporate the fact that there are a lot of lean starch eating cultures around the world. Right. Yeah. And so you, yeah. So I think, the, the, we see a lot of different scenarios of fatness and leanness. We know that people um, can lose weight by going to a ketogenic diet. We know that the French stayed lean on starch and butter. And so what I like about this theory is that it, it, it can explain all of those scenarios. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of other theories that, that do that. And one of the, I have another upcoming article and I'm going to be talking about obesity in newborn babies because mm. they clearly didn't get that way based on food reward and they didn't get that <laughs> way because they weren't exercising right they were born that way and yeah. so it's like that yeah 
It's not, it's not a food reward issue if a newborn is obese. Yeah, we were we were laughing about that with Amber because I was looking at watching. I just watched her presentation on the lipivore and comparing the fatness of baby, you know, human babies and infant seals and babies being fatter than infant seals. <laughs> it's just right. amazing. Like we, we just <laughs> insulate ourselves with with this massive layer of fat. Um, right. It's just so different from any other species and and. And I think, yeah, we're starting to appreciate just how much fat tissue is like a, an endocrine organ and a part of the immune system. It's, it's doing basic, uh, you know, body composition regulation. I don't think actually all of that is so centralized to the brain as a lot of people like to think. I don't think that it's, it's that. Available. I don't think so either. Yeah. No. I mean, the, the stupid I, I, example that I always give and, and I, I don't know, but it speaks to me is that like, so I, so if you, if you smoke, uh, smoke cannabis or have an edible and you get the munchies and you're going to eat more than you usually would. Right. That's usually what, what happens. Sure. You have this very clear reproducible mechanism yet. Like, if, if you look um, uh, epidemiologically, uh, cannabis smokers are actually more likely to be insulin sensitive and less obese. They have a lower BMI and all of that. And I think right. it's for the very simple reason that actually what's happening is a psychotropic effect changing the food reward, but that is in right. no way dysregulating the fundamental mechanisms that maintain body weight. I think it's totally separate. Uh, from yeah, that. yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I yeah. think that's a... And I also think that... Um, you know, I think our body adjusts to those. I think like, uh, you know, when we talk about the munchies, like I know, for instance, that so everybody says that, you know, so I'm a wine drinker, I make no secret about that. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody thinks that, oh, well, if you, you know, if I go out and I have, you know, some beers, then later I wind up at the late night pizza place and I binge eat because alcohol lowers your blood glucose and and makes you hungry that way but i know that since i consume wine every night i've done the test where i will you know right. test my blood glucose um then drink a bottle of wine test my blood glucose again an hour later two hours later three hours later like alcohol doesn't change yeah. my blood glucose at all because i'm I'm adapted to it. You know, my body has adjusted and I suspect the same thing is true of, you know, uh, a habitual cannabis user, right? Like if someone who never, who doesn't smoke cannabis often smokes cannabis, then yes, you're going to get the munchies. But in someone who does it regularly, you know, the body has ways of adapting to that, right? Like, yeah. And, and what's interesting is that it changes entirely based on the food you're eating. So I can remember, um, you know, having the munchies when I was maybe in my early 20s and eating a pretty terrible, pretty normal standard, terrible diet. Sure. And sure. I, I remember it being associated with like, ah, I ate too much. I felt this way. Uh, uh, like you, you can kind of sense that, oh, I overdid something. Whilst if I were to, to have the munchies now, eating the way I do, uh, which is pretty basically 95% carnivorous, uh, very high saturated fat diet, you know, high risk, sure. all that stuff. The, it's just no longer, there's no dysregulation anymore because it's happening in the context of probably uh, a, a, a lower, uh, sat um, higher saturated fat uh, adipose tissue saturation index. It's also happening in a context where I'm leaner. I have less visceral adipose tissue than I would have had you know, 10 years ago or right. something. There's all these things that change the response to the same chemical in, in essence. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But I, I, I agree with you that I do not think that the, the primary issue is food reward response in the brain. Um, it doesn't, I don't, it just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Me, me neither. I, I can see why it attracts people, but I can't uh, say that it, 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 it's particularly interesting to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've, I've kept you here a while. By the way, anytime you need to go, please just just tell me to, 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 to get lost and, uh, <laughs> and we oh, can sure. no, uh, it's a, it's a, catch it's a up fun another time. It's a fun conversation. Um, yeah, for me too, man. Uh, it's been a while that we've been chatting and never had a chance to do it in, in person. But I wanted to ask you about the, 
the the products that you have embedded in the article and that you're selling because i saw a lot of well, a lot i saw one person make a sort of a comment about selling things that aren't ready for for market and based on shoddy evidence and all that and i you know i thought about it for a second and i was like you know i, I for, first of all i read the article in its entirety so i know i know what you actually said not that there was not simply that there were products being sold on the page and I was like, okay, you're talking about increased markers of inflammation. You're talking about blood tests. You're talking about side effects. You're giving people the entire breakdown of why you think it's a good idea, a bad idea. The fact that, you know, these are available over the counter sort of stuff. And I was like, where's the problem in that? Yeah. And, and like, so like I, fundamentally. I, right. And so I went back and forth on this, um, you know, is this a good idea? And ultimately, I decided um, that I felt okay with it. Um, you know, if we're talking about the Sterculi oil, one is the fact that people eat it all the time in the tropics. And, right. and I, put, I put a lot of faith in um, this Prime sort exposure. of... Uh, yeah, prior exposure. Like I, I'm a, I ultimately I'm a, you know, I'm sort of a Weston A. Price guy. Like I believe, I believe in ancestral wisdom. You know what I mean? And I believe that people wouldn't be eating. Sterculia nuts are about fifty percent oil by weight, and so it's a very oily oh, nut. Wow. And so, so the oil that I'm selling my blog, it's no different than if you were to eat. Um, probably you know a handful of sterculia nuts or even two or three sterculia nuts right and this is right. a food that's totally eaten all different over the from a sunflower seed which which would be totally different if you're consuming right. large quantities of that oil exactly very different kinds of oil and and you know i'm suggesting consuming grams of it per day up to a teaspoon right and so so and and i think that if people in three continents of the world wouldn't be regularly consuming these nuts if there was some some real health health downside of it you know i sort of believe that ancestrally people probably would have figured out like okay that's not a good thing to eat somewhere right on one of the three continents people would be like no you shouldn't eat those but that doesn't that doesn't seem to be the case people eat them everywhere um so that was one thing that I, I was like, okay, well, I feel okay about this because this absolutely is a normally eaten human food. Um, so that was yeah. one line of evidence. And I guess the other line of evidence was simply the idea that, you know, if, if I sort of have like <laughs> the, the flip argument, I guess, is if I have this thing, and I think it can help people. And I know that it's a hard thing to obtain in the U S like who, am, <laughs> and I have the ability to do so and the knowledge, who am I to sort of not make it available to people? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so, so that's, that's kind of the opposite, the opposite argument, I guess. Yeah. It's like, well, let's, let's see what happens. I don't think it's, due to the fact that people eat it all over the world and i i'm just not i'm not in any kind of um oleic acid deficit i make tons of this stuff <laughs> right and so i don't think that right. giving myself an oleic acid deficiency is going to cause me any problems but like you say i'm doing the blood test regularly i'm checking my inflammation markers mm -hmm. i haven't seen anything um, that has sort of given me pause, uh, yet. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, um, I think a little bit, if people want to try a little bit of this, I think it's going to be interesting to see what results people get, you know, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in any case, you know, I think people are, are being way too precious and virtue signaling because even if it were dangerous, that's still not a reason to tell people that this is somehow, not the right thing to do or immoral or something because you know we're, we're in this era where people want to always blame someone else and 
someone has to take responsibility for their own health, but themselves, you know, that's never going to happen. And I think people have right. to start appreciating that, first of all, people who sell, who sell you snake oil stuff usually don't know about SCD1 or can't, <laughs> right. make, can't, can't actually make a sentence that would make sense with SCD1 in it, right? It would be very easy to spot. Right, uh, yes. And second of all, like, okay, if, if you're not sure about what to do, don't, don't buy it, don't try it, that's fine. Right, but exactly. But stop telling other people that they can't, uh, you know, hear it, right? Right, um, right. I just, it's in the, and, I, and I, maybe I'm being sensitive about this in the age of COVID with all the, the scientific censorship, but I think it's like enough already, like stop with this virtue signaling, like <laughs> yeah. just because there's a monetary value attached to something is not a reason to come out and criticize everything all the time. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, people are, are people who are interested and look at the science and go, yeah, that makes sense to me they're going to try it. And I'm, I'm really yeah. interested to see what results people get. Um, it's like what people do to Dave Feldman. Oh, his advice is killing people because he <laughs> right. says to not freak out about <laughs> cholesterol. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like Dave Feldman is not a public health threat. Like, yeah, just exactly. people have no sense of proportion. Like they'll eat cottonseed oil. Right. That's fine. Yeah. Right. That's that, fine. We'll give it, we'll give it to kids in large amounts. But, right. Yeah, sure. But this is crazy. <laughs> well, you, <laughs> you know, know what? You, you know what? Ironically, has a very small amount of stercolic acid is cottonseed oil, um, and right. I touch on that's, that that's true, a little actually. bit of my article too. So, so cottonseed oil, but right, that's but funny. we basically stopped. So, <laughs> cottonseed oil is a really hard to think about in your mind because it's this massive source of linoleic acid but it also <laughs> has a small amount of this scd1 inhibitor and so if you look right. at um if you look at uh, old agricultural literature about feeding pigs they say yeah well if you feed pigs um cottonseed meal which is a source of protein mm -hmm. um it will firm their it will help uh, make their fat firm, which is weird because you're like, well, why would that be? You know, cottonseed oil is a source of linoleic acid. We know that, or cottonseed meal. You know, cottonseed meals had most of the oil pressed out of it, right? So the total fat content is quite is fairly low. It's you know, um, and you're like, but still, why would feeding a seed oil to a pig make their fat firm? And it turns out it's because it has a small amount of this inhibitor. So, so the pigs given cottonseed are going to have less oleic acid but they're also going to have more linoleic acid. And it's a little unclear to me how that would, how that balance mm -hmm. would, you know, play out at the end of the day yeah. and even people eating. And of course, when people first started eating cottonseed oil, much of it was partially hydrogenated. So mm -hmm. now you're converting, now you're converting a lot of the linoleic acid into saturated fats or monounsaturated fats and yes some of it comes out as trans fat which isn't great but in some ways like the old um anyway the cottonseed you know crisco from 1915 mm -hmm. had a lot of problems i'm not saying it doesn't but it might not be fattening Quite the worst per yeah. se and then recently you know, and then around what, 1940 or 1950, basically mm -hmm. all of the, all of the old cottonseed oil things were replaced with soybean oil. And now everything yeah. is soybean oil. And that is, you know, that's the, just purely, well, mostly linoleic acid. Um, yeah, I used the wrong then, examples of all the oils I could have used. It's, it was, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an, inter it's an interesting example because it brings up this sort of complicated side conversation but obviously once people eating started eating a lot of soybean oil then we see you know obesity uh happening in big big ways um yeah 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 i have a, a last question uh for you about uh let's say current topic and and diet how how big an impact do you think diet can have uh for 
let's say if I had to narrow down the question, so how, how much risk you would have for COVID in terms of if once you would catch it, you know, how would the ARDS response that, that uh, you know, basically cytokine storm that, that, that kills you, how do you <laughs> think linked is it to the fat content of your, of your fat uh, cells? You know, the truth is I haven't, I haven't really looked into that. So I can't, I can't yeah. really speak knowledgeably on it. Um, and I'm not, I don't like to speculate on things that I haven't really looked at. Um, I would say that, you know, uh, Tucker Goodrich did a ton of mm -hmm. work on that and he wrote a very well-researched blog post about it. I think that is an interesting thing to check out, but I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to speculate on it though. <laughs> gotcha. Where, where's the fun in that? Where's the fun I know, I know. I wanted I'm wild speculation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's fine. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I remember uh, talking to Tucker in that, in that thread about it. It's, uh, it's an interesting question because I think, you know, fat turnover is slow, yet there's a lot of different signaling things going on depending on the dietary fat that's coming in, you know, sort of with sure. an immediate effect. So, so I don't know. It's uh, like you said, it would be a, a lot of speculation to, to say anything there, but yeah. It was uh, just something I had in mind like that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, man. So, oh yeah, tell everyone about your blog and what they can order off it. And right. Tell them about right. it one more time because I, I love that. I please uh, sell them in France so that we can uh, we can try well, them I, out. Well, <laughs> I, I am I am shipping and I am shipping to Europe and I'm I'm actually working on getting oh, cool. um, over the next week hopefully i've been having a lot of troubles with my shipping software i've got some actually really uh affordable international shipping options coming online so i think nice. like we can get things shipped to europe for like under 10 bucks it t it'll take a while but but cool. they'll they'll make their way over there um that'll be within a week or so hopefully um but nice. yeah so my blog my That's blog awesome. is fire in a bottle uh it's called fire in a bottle it's at fire in a bottle dot net um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, the user is fire underscore bottle and, um, yeah. And so I'm selling, um, steer so stearic acid is the long chain saturated fat. And, and, uh, I, you know, initially I was, I started losing weight by eating lots of long chain saturated fat, including stearic acid. And so I made this butter, which is basically, um, I melted a bunch of stearic acid into the butter to make this very high stearic acid butter that I was using. Um, and I did the, uh, the croissant diet where I was making these very high fat croissants with a lot of this fat and, and sort of using the flour as a vehicle to consume a lot of saturated fat. And that actually was really effective at first at helping me to lose weight. And, and a lot of other people have gotten similar results. It hasn't worked for everybody, but it's an interesting thing to try. And so, so I'm selling, um, on my blog, I sell the straight stearic acid, which is like a fine powder, uh, stearic acid as a high melting point. It's like candle wax. Um, uh, and then I also sell the butter itself. So the butter is sort of cranked up to be as high octane as it can be without turning to wax in your mouth ultimately which is what <laughs> happens if you add too much stearic acid to it um and so people have had really good good response with that um I, it 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 seems to have an effect of increasing um satiety after a meal um like if someone uses this high stearic acid butter um you know some people put it on their steak um if they're you know a lot of carnivores have tried it as like a steak sauce or other things um you know, other people have done where they add it to a potato or a pastry or whatever um, to try to help with satiation. And so, um, and that also will hopefully, if you're getting a lot of stearic acid and it's going into your mitochondria, hopefully that will also, you know, drive the same reaction that's causing, um, you know, those uncoupling proteins to be produced. If you, all that stearic acid is being burned, you're going to make ROS you're going to uncouple, you're going to get increased metabolic rate, hopefully, in addition to 
the the satiety um and so that that's sort of like how i'm tackling this um concept from the dietary angle right and then the flip side is like okay but your stored fat is also entering the mitochondria and that's a problem on the other side and that is where i'm having this sterculia oil imported and bottled and sent out and so it's 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 coming it's coming um it's not quite here yet but but hopefully it'll be shipping in january and so um and so that that takes on the other effect that that will uh has been shown in lots of studies to um you know block the scd1 and it will um it will help you start to whittle down your body stores of oleic acid and start replacing them with stearic acid and hopefully over time that will increase your metabolic rate and allow you to do thermogenesis um, based on the amount of leptin you probably if you're obese you probably are making lots of leptin but it's not able to do its job until your fat is sufficiently saturated that is that is at the that's basically the core of the argument um it's so you're hitting it from all angles the stearic acid the uh the pork uh, products the right. uh, the uncoupling supplements so you're you're providing like a complete package for, for <laughs> right right exactly just like increase and, fat flux and, and burn it off right oh yeah and, and i should plug that by the way uh it firebrand meats is the name of my website where i'm selling the 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 pork that's low in polyunsaturated fat um so check that out and like i say those pigs are finally getting to be market size and they're they're getting processed this week so it's an exciting week yeah uh, and vegans vegans listen up the they had a very very beautiful happy life i assure you those Absolutely. pigs and, and, they and had a be better clear, time than we had during lockdown okay they were way happier than we were so do not pity the pig that's true and to be clear you know there's nothing about um about this theory or my theories that excludes vegans um you could absolutely read I, my whole I was blog hoping it did and say <laughs> <laughs> but you could absolutely read my whole blog and say, okay, I want to do this as a vegan. And instead of using butter and bone marrow, I'm going to use, I'm going to use cocoa butter. Um, true, true. Very and true. I'm going to do it that way. So, you know, I don't, I'm, I've been a, I've raised pastured pigs for 15 years. Right. I, I ran a butcher shop. Um, so, and I've, done keto many times in my life so my background is in meat and in keto but having said that <laughs> um you know nothing about the scd1 theory of obesity or the ros theory of obesity suggests that you couldn't do it as a vegan um True. so yeah it's it's inclusive <laughs> right. Good. Fair enough. Good. 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 We need yeah. more, more inclusion and more cranks like myself. Actually, I'll throw. <laughs> I'm gonna throw. I'll throw one more little quick anecdote in. Um, my friend sent me an article the other day of a isolated group of people. I think they were in South America, and you know they were living off a traditional diet. I think it was like plantain and yucca and some other plant but they were all very high starch very low fat plants so they were eating you know a very high starch diet and they opened a a store locally where they could buy um you know imported foods probably the you know probably the classic right flour and sugar and vegetable oil and and there was a health clinic there so they had really detailed uh you know health information about them and over the first i think 15 years that the store was open and they were able to buy vegetable oil 
the average body temperature in the whole population dropped by a half a degree in, in 15 years of having access to vegetable oil. Wow. Amazing. And so that's an anecdote that, yes, the more unsaturated fat you eat, the less you are able to uncouple and do thermogenesis. That's super and interesting. It, you know, because I I'm a human radiator. Like it's it's crazy. I run crazy hot. I'm I'm always outside in the winter, running right. without a shirt. It's, it's sure. just I run way way hotter. So it would be interesting to see how well that correlates with my fatty acid the saturation index. I'd like yeah yeah yeah. That. I I'd love to I'd love to hear your result. That'd be interesting. Yeah, but. send me the link for the company and maybe i'll ask for for that to be my christmas present i can send it to someone in my family and <laughs> right yeah <laughs> cool yeah I'll, I'll send it over all right awesome um, perfect uh yeah okay perfect so i think we got all the information people go try things out live crazy it's pandemic lockdown time so we're not going to live long anyway so you know you might as well try right. doing something really <laughs> crazy and interesting so go ahead try out stuff never mind the haters uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was really fun talking with you, Brad. Uh, yeah, we absolutely. Do this again, sometime. when you have yeah, another, no, another interesting product, come come back on and we'll chat. Yeah, that sounds great. All Perfect. right, I'll stop the Talk recording. To you soon.